Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Wyatt and I'm here this week to talk to you about um, author's purpose and specifically we're looking at Coming of Age in the Dawnland written by Charles C. Mann. So this is a history writing um, document and you can access this either through Ed or um, I think it starts on page 69 in your book. I've also included a PDF um, if your electronic book isn't working. And what you're going to do is you're going to read this and you're going to answer the questions on the paper. So um, if you go to the agenda, you'll see the assignment down here, read coming to age in the Dawnland and take notes. And then this paper right here will load. Here's the PDF if you need it. You click on that. You let it load. And then here are the things that I would like for you to focus on. So we're going to read this together um, on video today simply because when my in-person classes meet, that's what I do with them. And uh, I know you can listen to it, but I think it'd be good for us to read it together. You ready? Here we go. So this was written by a journalist, a science journalist, Charles C. Mann. Um, he specializes in... Um, colonialism and like the state of the Americas before the colonists came over. So we're going to read some about this story specifically. So here we go. As you read, it says, look for ways man draws parallels between the daily lives of settlers and Native American people. Notice how the European settlers viewed Native American customs and practices. Think back to Bradford, which is the Up Plymouth Plantation we read last week. Account in the excerpt from Up Plymouth Plantation and look for similar ideas in the text. So here we go. Consider Tisquantum, the friendly Indian of the textbook. More than likely, Tisquantum was not the name that he was given at birth. In that part of the Northeast, does quantum refer to rage, especially rage of Manitou, the world suffusing spiritual power at the heart of coastal Indians' religious beliefs? When does quantum approached the pilgrims and identified himself by that sobriquet, it was as if he stuck out his hand and said, Hello, I'm the wrath of God. No one would lightly adopt such a name in contemporary Western society. Neither would anyone in 17th century indigenous society. Tisquantum was trying to project something. Okay, so Tisquantum is Squanto, the guy that we read about who helps the um, the pilgrims or the colonists in the last story. So they're saying that he's identifying himself as Tisquantum, which is saying, like, I am the wrath of God and I am rage. But, of course, the colonists don't understand that. If you click this link here, it'll talk a little bit about project, like communicate something, it'll give you the footnote of a sobriquet as a nickname. So that might help you a little bit as you go through if you use this book. You'll see here um, the map of where everyone was um, and like kind of how everything was, was laid out on the East Coast and like which tribes were part of which section. And then that's, this is Squantum where he, where he grew up. And then we talked about the Massasoits um, when we talked about Massachusetts. And um, we talked about, you know, the, that area and especially where settlers were um, during the colony's time, the colonial time. Okay. Tisquantum was not an Indian True, he belonged to that category of people whose ancestors had inhabited the Western Hemisphere for thousands of years. And it is true that I refer to him as Indian because the label's useful shorthand. So would his descendants. But for much the same reason. But Indian was not a category that Tisquantum himself would have recognized. Any more than the inhabitants of the same area today call themselves Western Hemispherians. Still, less would Tisquantum have claimed to belong to Norumbega, the label by which most Europeans referred to New England. New England was coined only in 1616. As Tisquantum's later history made clear, he regarded himself first and foremost as a city, as a citizen of Patuxet, a shoreline settlement halfway between what is now Boston and the beginning of Cape Cod. So he would regard himself as someone who lived here. And it's important to think about 
you know, where he, where he considers himself um, a native from, because place is identity, especially during this time. So this asks you to highlight words and phrases in paragraph two that indicate the author is presenting new or surprising information. And you can do that as well as you go. Patuxent was one of the dozen or so settlements in what is now Eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island that comprised the Wampanoag Confederation. In turn, the Wampanoag were a part of a tri tripartite alliance with two other confederations, the Nauset, which comprised some 30 dozen groups on Cape Cod, the Massachusetts, several dozen villages clustered around Massachusetts Bay. All of these people spoke variants of Massachusetts, a member of the Algonquin language family the biggest in Eastern North America at the time. Massachusetts thus was the name, both of a language and one of the groups that spoke it. In Massachusetts, the name for the New England shore was the Dawnland, the place where the sun arose. The inhabitants of the Dawnland were the people of the first light. Tucked into a great sweep of Cape Cod Bay, Patuxet sat on a low rise above a small harbor, jigsawed by sandbars and shallow enough that children could walk from the beach hundreds of yards into the water before the waves went above their heads. To the west, mazy hills marched across the, silly, the sandy hillocks in parallel rows. Beyond the fields, a mile or more away from the sea, there was a forest of oak, chestnut, and hickory, open and park-like, the underbrush kept down by expert annual burning. Pleasant of air and prospect, as one English visitor described the area, Patuxet had much plenty, both of fish and fowl, every day in the year. Runs of spawning Atlantic salmon, short-nosed spurgeon, surgeon, striped bass, and American shad annually filled the harbor. But the most important fish harvest came in late spring when the herring-like alewives swimmed the swarmed the fast, shallow stream and cut through the village. So numerous were the fish and so driven that when mischievous boys walled off the stream with stones and the alewives would leap the barrier, silver bodies gleaming in the sun and pursued upstream. So this is a very positive paragraph. This is like, this is him describing what things kind of looked like and what they relied on as their food source and talking about the fish and, you know, what the boys would do. And just think about all the positive imagery that he creates here. And this asks you to analyze those and find that, find all the positive words in um, paragraph four. Because connotation is what the meaning of the words are, right? Tisquantum's childhood wetu, which was his home, was formed from arch poles lashed together into a dome that was covered in winter by tightly woven rush mats and in summer by thin sheets of chestnut bark. A fire burned constantly in the center, the smoke venting through the hole in the center of the roof. English visitors did not find this arrangement peculiar. Chimneys were just as common to use in Britain, and most homes were, including those of the wealthy, were still heated by fires beneath central roof holes. Nor did the English regard the Dawnland Wetu as primitive. Its multiple layers of mats, which trapped insulating layers of air, were warmer than our English houses, sighed the colonist William Wood. The Wetu was less leaky, leaky than the typical English wattle and dove house, too. Wood did not conceal his admiration for the way Indian mats deny entrance to the any drop of rain, though it come both fierce and long. So, the interesting thing there. Describe the English's reaction to the Patuxet homes. So they talk here about how nice and sturdily built they are and how they're even better than English homes, which shows that there was some respect there between the colonists and the, and the natives. And here's what one of them kind of looked like, the exterior of a wetu. Around the edge of the house were low beds, sometimes wide enough for a whole family to sprawl to them together, usually raised about a foot from the floor, platform style, and always piled with mats and furs. Going to sleep in the firelight, young Tisquantum would have stared up at the dittering shadows of the hemp bags and bark boxes hanging from the rafters. Voices would scurl up in the darkness, one person singing a lullaby, then another person until everyone was asleep. In the morning when he woke, big edge-shaped pots of corn and bean mash would be on the fire simmering with meat, vegetables, or dried fish to make a slow-cooked dinner stew. Outside the wetu, he would hear the cheerful thuds of the large mortars and pestles in which women crushed dried maize into nokake, 
a flower-like powder, so sweet, toothsome, and hearty, colonists cook and wrote, that an Indian will travel many days with no other but this meal. Although Europeans bemoaned the lack of salt in Indian cuisine, they thought it nourishing. According to one modern reconstruction, Donland diets at this time averaged about 2,500 calories a day, better than those usual in famine-wracked Europe. So, highlight a comparison in paragraph six of the diets of Patuxent and European citizens. So, they talk about that difference, right? They talk about how, you know, um, European citizens didn't have as much food or their diets weren't as rich because they were used to famine. And thinking about that, in Europe, you know, cities were a lot more widespread. And in native lands, they relied on themselves. They farmed their own land. They hunted for themselves. Sometimes they would trade with other tribes, but they had to be completely self-sufficient. And they had been living like this for so long, 9,000 years at this point, right? That they had this down to a science. Like they knew exactly what they were doing and, and how to get their food and get their nourishment, which is why they had so much more. Pilgrim writers universally reported that Wampanoag families were close and loving, more so than English families, some thought. Europeans in those days tended to view children as moving straight from infancy to adulthood around the age of seven, and often thereupon sent them out to work. Indian parents, by contrast, regarded the years before puberty as a time of playful development and kept their offspring close by until marriage. Jarringly, to the contemporary eyes, some pilgrims interpreted this as sparing the rod. Boys like Tisquantum explored the countryside, swam in the ponds at the south end of the harbor, and played a kind of soccer with a small leather ball. In the summer and fall, they camped out in huts in the field, weeding the maize by chase and chasing away birds. Archery practice began at age two. By adolescence, boys would make a game of shooting at each other and dodging the arrows. The primary goal of Dawnland education was molding character. Men and women were expected to be brave, hardy, honest, and uncomplaining. Chatterboxes and gossips were frowned upon. He that speaks seldom and inopportunely, being as good as his word, is the only man they love, Wood explained. Character form formation began early, with family games of tossing naked children into the snow. They were pulled out quickly and placed next to the fire in a practice reminiscent of Scandinavian saunas. When Indian boys came of age, they spent an entire winter alone in the forest, equipped with a, only with a bow, a hatchet, and a knife. These methods worked, and Odd Wood reported, Beat them, whip them, pinch them, punch them. If the Indians resolve not to flinch for it, they will not. So here's what the interior of a wet suit looked like. And so you get a little bit of look into their culture, their family structure, their values, their education, which um, is very much about being reliable and being honest and being close together um, and, and cherishing their children and taking care of one another. Tisquantum's regimen, which is a routine, was probably tougher than that of his friends, according to Salisbury, the Smith College historian, for it seems that he was selected to become a prenice, a kind of counselor bodyguard to the sachem. To the master the art of ignoring pain, future prenice had to subject themselves to such miserable experiences as running barelegged through brambles. Brambles are like those sharp, um, thorny bushes. And they fasted often to learn self-discipline, spending their winter in the woods. Panese candidates came back to an additional test, drinking bitter gentian juice until they vomited, repeating this bulimic process over and over until nothing near fainting, they threw up blood. Ooh, that sounds intense. Highlight words and images in paragraphs eight and nine that have negative connotations, so negative feelings, negative emotions, negative images. Highlight some negative things that you that you can see here in nine and then also in ten here. Patuxent, like its neighboring settlements, was governed by a sachem who upheld the law, negotiated treaties, controlled foreign contracts, collected tribute, declared war, provided for widows and orphans, and allocated farmland when there were disputes over it. Dawnlanders lived in a loose scatter, but they knew which family could use which land. Very exact and punctual, Roger Williams, founder of Rhode Island Colony, called Indian Care for Property Lines. Most of the time, the Patuxent Sachem owed fealty to the great Sachem in the Wampanoag village to the southwest, and through him to the Sachems of the Allied Confederations of the Nauset and Cape Cod and the Massachusetts around Boston. Meanwhile, the Wampanoag were rivals and enemies of the 
Narragansett in the head quotes, to the west into the many groups of Abenaki to the north. As a practical matter, Sachems had to gain the consent of their people, who would easily move away and join another Sachem ship. Analogously, the great Sachems had to please or bully the lesser, lest by the defection of small communities they lose stature. So this was kind of like the Sachems were kind of like governors, and if their people were not happy, they would move to a different Sachem ship or like a different town almost, even though they didn't really call them towns. And this was just kind of their hierarchical organization and how their government worked. Um, the annotation says talks about subordinate clauses and details and things like that. We can skip that one for now. We'll talk more about clauses next week. 16th century New England housed 100,000 people or more, a figure that was slowly increasing. Most of those people lived in shoreline communities where rising numbers were beginning to change agriculture from an option to a necessity. These bigger settlements required more centralized administration, natural resources like good land and spawning streams, though not scarce, now needed to be managed. In consequence, boundaries between groups were becoming more formal. Sachems, given more power and more to defend, pushed against each other harder. Political tensions were constant. Coastal and reverie New England, according to the archaeologists and ethno-historian ethno Peter Thomas was an ever-changing collage of personalities, alliances, plots, raids, and encounters, which involved every Indian settlement. So as more people in the population grew, the more complicated all these treaties kind of became between the different tribes and the different Sachem hoods. Armed conflict was frequent but brief and mild by European standards. The cause of spelly was usually the desire to avenge an insult or gain status, not the wish for conquest. So if they did fight each other, it was for like kind of petty reasons, like avenging some sort of insult or to gain a good reputation. It wasn't because they wanted to take over someone's land, which is different than how Europeans viewed um, a lot of their wars, a lot of it was about conquest, taking over, whereas the natives, they only fought each other for honor and for status. Most battles consist of lightning guerrilla raids by ad hoc companies in the forest, flash of brick, black and yellow striped bows behind trees, hiss and whip of stones, tipped arrows through the air, eruption of angry cries, attackers slipped away as soon as retribution has been exacted. Losers quickly conceded their loss of status. Doing otherwise would have been like a failing to resign after losing a major piece in a chess tournament, a social irritant, a waste of time and resources. Women and children were rarely killed, though they were sometimes abducted and forced to join the winning group. Captured men were often tortured. They were admired, though not necessarily spared if they endured the pain stoically. Now and then, as a sign of victory, slain foes were scalped, much as British skirmishes with the Irish sometimes finished with a parade of Irish heads on pikes. In especially large clashes, adversaries might meet in the open, as in European battlefields, though the results, Roger Williams noted, were far less bloody, and devouring then the cruel wares of Europe, wars of Europe. Nevertheless, by Tisquantum's time, defensive palisades, palisades were increasingly common, especially in the River Valley. So as more people became or came, um, the population grew, more fighting happened. And remember, we're talking about this is before the Europeans showed up. This is us describing Tisquantum's childhood, and the Europeans didn't show up until he was older. So for annotating, highlight the foreign phrases the author uses in the second sentence on paragraph 12. So it would be, the causus belli was usually to desire, the desire to avenge or an insult or gain status, not the wish for conquest. And that is a Latin phrase that means cause for war, because belli, bellum is war. All right. Inside the settlement was a world of warmth, family, and familiar custom. But the world outside, as Thomas put it, was a maze of confusing actions and individuals fighting to maintain an existence in the shadow of change. And that was before the Europeans showed up. So even before the Europeans came, there was a lot of change going on. And this is like, this is the pistol, um, the little stick, and then this is the bowl where they would grind up the maize or the corn to make food. Last thing to annotate, go back to chapter or paragraph 13 and highlight words that describe um, the contrast between inside and outside settlement. Like what's, what's it like inside and what's it like outside? 
um, the settlement or the town for the native people. I hope this gave you a little bit of clarity on the Dawnland. And um, if you go back and you answer some of these questions, you fill out these notes, you should be good. Remember when you do CER at the bottom that you use three examples. Please hit me up if you have any questions, and I hope that you have a good week. Thanks.